What I wanted to do today was take you on a journey through the relationship between Hollywood and China over the decades. We are at a moment in time now where there is so much going on. There's drama every day. It's on the front page of the newspapers. And Hollywood and China have become interesting but unusual bedfellows. And so it was not always this way. There was a lot of yearning on both sides. Hollywood and China couldn't have been in completely different places, though. There was a budding film community in the 80s. They were obviously coming out of the Cultural Revolution, so that was very much on their minds what films could be made. It was a tentativeness about that. In the meantime, Hollywood is on the top of the world. They're dominating box office all over the world, and it looks like no one can even touch them. I then had the opportunity to work on the film Empire of the Sun, which was a huge production. It was made at a time when if you needed 5,000 extras, you actually had to find 5,000 bodies. It was, um, and that's what we did on the streets of Shanghai in the most crowded intersection, the Bund, and uh, it was an incredible experience. Uh, it was something that we often talk about as being only possible in that moment in time. Had it been much earlier, the China would not have been ready. The infrastructure was not there. Had it been much later, Shanghai would have changed so much that you could not recreate 30s and 40s Shanghai in that moment. So that film was made as was another very high profile film just around the same time in Beijing. That was Bernardo Bertolucci's The Last Emperor. So Steven Spielberg and Bernardo Bertolucci, two of the most celebrated directors of the time, were making films in China, and many thought this was the harbinger of things to come. This was the beginning of a trend. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. Uh, 1989 and Tiananmen, I think, pretty much squelched a lot of people's enthusiasm for China in that moment. We were able to shoot part of Joy Luck Club there, and there were a few other films that were made at the time about China in the 90s because people were very curious at the time about China, so there were some projects that were made. Unfortunately, they were not films that were particularly friendly to China in the minds of the Chinese government. One was Kundun, one was Seven Years in Tibet. Both of those obviously had to do with Tibet. Another was a movie called Red Corner. So perhaps uh, relations between Hollywood and China in terms of at least co-productions were particularly chilly then. Those studios that made those films were, were in fact punished to some degree and were not able to really get much traction in China during those years. However, other films started showing in China on a revenue share basis. There was finally the beginning of a, you know, a, a real um, agreement between studios in China on how to show films. In the 80s, when I was representing the studios, we sold some American films, so they were all done on a not exactly revenue share basis. Um, so the 90s was the beginning of a, of a more kind of consistent flow of studio films. One of the first films happened to be The Fugitive by Andy Davis. In the meantime, however, Chinese filmmakers were really growing and uh, flourishing. I think some of the best Chinese films made over the decades were from the 90s. We have uh, some great films from Chiang Kai-ge, such as Emperor and the Assassin, uh, Farewell My Concubine, which um, was really expected to win an Oscar that year, and unfortunately did not. But Zhang Yimou was making film after film, year after year, uh, Raise the Red Lantern, Judo, Story of Chiuji, and The Road Home, just to name a few. And of course, Gong Li was coming up popular. So these films were actually getting into film festivals and getting a lot of awards and really putting Chinese film on a map, on the map in a certain way, at least. They were seen as being films that were very, very artistic and very uniquely Chinese. A lot changed in 2000. That was the year that Crouching Tiger was made. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was a huge phenomenon on so many levels. It was a film that was made in the Chinese language and therefore initially not expected to do particularly well outside of the Chinese speaking territories. It was supposed to be more for the Chinese market. It was made for a very modest budget, around $10 million. It was groundbreaking in that I think it combined both the action genre with something much more artistic. And so it was seen as something that was both very universally appealing but also uniquely Chinese. We had not really seen a Chinese film 
that was so elegant and so uh, appealing to non-action film fans as well as to action film fans. It really is the brilliance of Ang Lee to, to pull off something like that. And what it ended up doing was it handed to China a genre that they actually had kind of lost. They actually, mainly China had actually not made um, many action films. The action films that many people think about were really made more in Hong Kong. And, uh, and m there were many, many action film directors in Hong Kong. Um, but now the Chinese filmmakers from mainland China could think, oh, well, here's an interesting genre. And indeed, that's what they did, because that film spawned the likes of the very, very successful Hero and um, House of Flying Daggers, the two films made by Zhang Mo, which, like Crouching Tiger, also did very well in the worldwide market. Um, and then there were a host of other films that, while they were not nearly as um, successful outside of Asia, they certainly kept the Chinese film market and the Asian film market in general robust. And really for a whole decade approximately, these films have sustained China. And it allowed the box office to grow and it gave Chinese confidence. In the meantime, back here at Hollywood, things are starting to fade a little bit. Um, in the 90s, we saw actually a lot of foreign markets starting to build up and the American film market was just starting to go down a little bit. People were thinking, ah, oh, is it the DVD market? Is it gonna steal the theatrical market? Um, there started to be many more uh, films made based on just foreign sales. This has become sort of the new thing. Gradually, more and more American films are playing in China and the box office for these films, too, is becoming significant. And when the film started crossing that $100 million mark, that's when I think people just had to sit up and say, uh oh, wait, 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 what, what's going on here? Chi chi our films are actually making $100 million mark. Then films started actually playing better in China than they were in America. That is huge. And then people started looking at the growth of the Chinese market and realized it was on an extremely steep ascent, that the market literally was growing 30%, growing 40%, sometimes 50% per year. In the meantime, the American box office is basically flat. It has not gone up. It's sometimes gone down a little bit. It goes up slightly, more to do with the rise in ticket prices, the overall ticket numbers are not significantly going up. In the meantime, nor is the DVD market growing. In the meantime, nor is the foreign sales market growing and the TV advertising market growing with all, everything going digital. Advertisers are starting to pull back a little bit. So Hollywood is desperately looking for that place, that thing, that opportunity that's going to give them the high growth that they were used to. And most places are sort of closing down on them and saying, no, this is not going to grow. China looks like the last great hope. Everyone predicts that before the end of the decade, whether it's 2017, 18, 19, we don't know, the Chinese box office will surpass the U.S.'s box office. This is the first time in history that anyone's even come close, and it's certainly the first time in history that the U.S. will no longer dominate worldwide box office. So. Clearly, Hollywood is is doing what it can now to play is it to play catch up. Is it too little, too late? Not really. Hollywood still has a number of things that China desperately wants, and China clearly has things that Hollywood wants. Three people here, I think, are in a position to share their views. The first is Daniel Shaw, someone who uh, for a long time he called me his work wife. We were, <laughs> we made a film together recently called Shanghai Calling that he wrote and directed. And uh, it did receive good notice in both America and China. Let's welcome Daniel. <laughs> this extension comes to us from DMG. DMG is a very well-known company in China that has been behind uh, initially that I first hearing a lot of, started hearing a lot about them when they were involved in the film Du La La, which was uh, managed to get just a really impressive amount of product placement. They were involved in Looper and now Iron Man 3. It's Chris Fenton. <laughs> uh, Bennett Pozel, who is, works at East West Bank and is probably the premier bank that is active in the China film market. 
that is uh, making, is offering money to people who want to make films in China. Imagine that. <laughs> so he's, he's my friend. <laughs> Bennett Pazell is here. Um, I want to just first ask a question to all of you. We are, we're, in a, we're in brand new territory here. You know, I, I'm a little bit of a veteran because I've been kicking around for a long time. But for so many people, China is a, is a brand new thing. And people want to deliver what Chinese audiences want. How do you even begin to know what they want? Anybody? Uh, Daniel. Hello? Hi. Um, I guess I will answer that question first. I think it's actually very difficult to understand what the uh, Chinese audience craves for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it's very unclear to anyone even working in China what it is the Chinese audience wants. Uh, the movie studios you talk to over there, they're always chasing the thing that just um, was a big hit. Uh, after When Janet and I first started going to China, Avatar had just crushed everything in the box office, and the first few meetings we had were with producers who kept saying, we want to make big 3D movies. We want to spend $100 million per movie. It's going to be 3D. We're only going to shoot 3D. And then within a couple of years, it was, no, we're, uh, every producer we said, what we met with said, no, actually, we only want to shoot small movies. We only want to spend uh, two to three million dollars per movie, and uh, it's got to be, you know, it's got to be on a budget and, and be able to uh, and, and have strong marketability. But I think that from the standpoint of uh, screenwriter and director, if you're a creator here in the U.S. and you're trying to, you know, tap into that market, um, our understanding of China here in the U.S. is actually remarkably um, out of touch with what's actually happening in China. I mean, uh, if you when we when we told people we were going to go start filming this uh, movie in China, a lot of people said, oh, well, so it's, you know, it's a kung fu movie, it's, you know, it's Imperial Times, everyone's going to be flying around in robes and stuff. You're like, no, no, it's a contemporary film. And, and they couldn't wrap their heads around that. Um, and I think it's just because what we've seen here in the US of China has mostly been those period uh, costume dramas and action movies, um, whereas there are, haven't been a lot of uh, widely seen films or television shows here in the US that take place in modern day China. And that being the case, you know, I've, I've been approached with, you know, a screenplay saying, oh, do you want to, is this something you'd be interested in directing or doing a rewrite on? It takes place in China and, I, and I'll read it and it just, um, it's so, uh, oftentimes just the screenplays are just full of stereotypes and misconceptions about what is happening in China and I wonder, you know, like, have, have, has the writer spent actually time there researching it? And I think that that's one of the key things, just spend a lot of time in China and watch a lot of movies there and talk to a lot of people, make friends, um, not just, you know, um, local, I'm not, not just foreign expat friends, but, you know, talk to locals and talk to, uh, talk to them and see what they, what they like. Okay, I, I do remember that when I was, we were trying to get financing out of, uh, for Shanghai Calling, I convinced them that they should really go out for these young, eager, but experienced Chinese-American filmmakers who had some affection for China. And then I heard that argument come back to me about six months later, like, yeah, we're really looking for, you know, product from uh, Chinese-American filmmakers. So it worked. Yeah. Chris, what, what do you guys look for? Um, well, this, it's, it's a very, it could be a very long-winded answer, put it that way. Um, it's always hard to sort of bullet point this kind of stuff because there's so much nuance to China, as, as, as we all know. And there's a lot of nuance to the United States, too. But when we look at a potential piece of product, we want to think about whether we can sell it both to the Chinese government, but then also to the Chinese consumer. And I'm not saying, oh, can we make sure it's government propaganda or is it completely censor-proof or whatever. But the key for us is to make, make sure that we're sort of uh, satisfying government mandates, which would be the same government mandates if the United States of America was in China's shoes. I mean, a lot of times when I talk about China, people think I'm sort of a shill for China and I'm loyal to China. Well, actually, I'm a U.S. born and raised person here. I'm a patriot. But I do see a real opportunity to create real value to the United States as a citizen here by trying to figure out how to open what's going to be the largest market in the world for one of the few exports that they actually want of ours. We don't make a lot of stuff here in the U.S., unfortunately, that the Chinese want. It's usually the other way around. So when we look at what's going to work in China, first of all, we have to think of it from a macro perspective. I mean, where does the government sit on sort of their macro agenda when it looks at the film industry? And quite frankly, what they want to do 
is build their own film industry. And probably in a perfect world, and they would never say it, and if we were in the same situation, we wouldn't say it to China, but they'd probably like to have their own film industry that satisfies their own consumers totally self-sufficiently and never have to worry about importing anything. Because we would do the same thing. If we didn't have to import anything from around the world, we probably would close our borders to it. Um, so the fact of the matter is, what we look at is sort of, okay, if they're trying to build a film industry, how do we create a product that's gonna help them satisfy that agenda while also satisfying the agenda of the government there, which is we wanna please our people and work for the people and make them happy. So what's that content? So when you look at the consumer, the consumer's looking at, we want Hollywood content. I mean, we want big blockbuster entertainment. Yes, they also want the Lost in Thailands and so on, but they also want that big sort of event picture. So how do you take the big event picture and fit it into the government agenda while not making it a piece of propaganda that the, the consumer is going to shut off? So it's a delicate balancing act. You want to figure out a way to show that you're using uh, the agenda to, to satisfy all parties, which is let's create a piece of product that helps nurture the film industry in China somehow. Maybe you're using Chinese elements in it, maybe you're shooting it in China partially, maybe you're using post houses there, maybe it has some Chinese thematics to it, etc. Then also make sure that it's got that Hollywood excitement and blockbuster feel to it so the consumer gets excited. And then also maybe put some kernels in there that gets the consumer excited that they're rooting for a hero or rooting for something that's inherently Chinese, almost like they're rooting for the home team. But then on top of it, you gotta make sure that same movie works with the guy coming out of the theater in Peoria, Illinois, or coming out of the theater in Frankfurt, Germany. So they don't wanna see something that's overly Chinese. So it's a very delicate balancing act. But the number one thing is, is it's got to be a great piece of Hollywood US studio content if we're gonna get it in there. And number two is we gotta make sure it's somehow satisfying what the Chinese are very proud of, which is their own film industry and the fact that they do wanna help nurture that to the point where it is at a, at a global powerhouse stage. So let me ask you, do you see your competition being other Hollywood films or other local films? Well, it's funny, uh, last year, I think we would have seen it as other Hollywood movies, um, but um, we did know that somewhere down the line we would see this Bollywood sort of situation if we didn't get smart about the way we approached the China market. And when I say we, I'm saying Hollywood in general. Um, what's interesting is that that Bollywood effect, that tipping point where suddenly we're going, oh my God, we might lose these consumers forever has happened faster than anybody's ever expected. I mean, literally, we are at the tipping point right now. Uh, the box office is dominated by domestic product in China, and if we don't get our act together, um, <laughs> we're gonna see another India, and that's something that I don't think Hollywood can afford. So it puts your company in an interesting position because you are more, lately anyway, you've been doing more Hollywood movies and you said the Chinese audiences want Hollywood fare, but now we're also seeing they can also appreciate non-Hollywood fare. So does that mean for you that you might also try and do things just for the Chinese audience or are you going to stick perhaps to your strategy of going with the Hollywood films that will hopefully also play in China? Well, that's a great question because um, you mentioned Do La La, which was a great success for us. That movie was only made for $2 million. And up until this year, um, we make, we're involved with probably three or four local movies a year in the, in the price range, except for um, some of the bigger things we were involved with, with other parties like Founding the Republic, those kind of movies. Um, we were sort of targeting that two to four million dollar budget range. That sort of seemed like the right business model, the right amount of risk. Now suddenly with, you know, movies making 200 million USD, by the way, um, you can start to expand upon that. So that's pretty exciting. I mean, the idea of being able to actually make something a little bigger and, and neater and almost Hollywood-esque for the Chinese market, and then maybe that pie in the sky potential of it working around the world, I mean, that would be incredible. And by the way, the Chinese government and the Chinese people would, would embrace that. I mean, the idea of making a movie there that works around the world, I mean, how exciting would that be? 
It's the same way we're getting excited with the fact that the international market wants to see our movies. In fact, they're contributing 70, what is it, 70, 80 percent of the box office on some of these things. So it's there's a lot of pride involved. And honestly, when you look at China and people grumble about the way they behave or whatever, a lot of times I say, you know what, imagine if the roles were reversed. We'd be doing the exact same thing. And in fact, if you look at some of the industries that we're trying to nurture here, I mean, whether it's solar panels or tires or whatever, we're trying to do the same thing to help our own local companies. So it's, it's not all China's fault. In fact, we've got to look in the mirror a lot of times. So you are in the enviable position to give money away. How do you figure out what movies are worth? You know, who brought about $240 with me today, so I don't know what you can make for that. I'll take it all. But we'll get the film school in over here. You know, I like what everybody has said so far. And quite honestly, I think this is one of the best discussions that we've had. We were on a, a strange panel earlier in the week, uh, because you never know what you're going to get. But I think that today we've kind of touched, I think, the, the, the kind of cutting edge where we are right now. I was I'm, a, I'm a big fan of what all three of you are doing and those pictures and Love and Looper. And, I think what Chris was saying was right on, that last year, uh, US films or English language films is what everybody seemed to want to see. And part of the reason for that is they were on two week windows, not all of them, but most of them were playing for two weeks. And when you take the 20 best studio movies, they're typically, not that they're great, they're worth watching. But when you get to film number 21, or film number 30, or film number 40, in any country, you start finding out that our films suck just as bad as everybody else's. So you're saying, you know, why should I see the Lincoln Lawyer when I can see Lost in Town? Or whatever that happens to be. And so, um, was talking with Rob Kane and, and with you, I think it was about last December, uh, or just before last December, we all thought there'd be a point in time where the Chinese pictures would start taking over in the marketplace. I didn't think it was going to be December. And what's interesting, is that a lot of Chinese companies, if it's Bona, Hawaii, and Light, LaVision, just paid big money last November at AFM for American pictures or English language pictures that are not part of the quota system, that are not part of the co-production system, but they're part of the buyouts, where you have no guarantee you can even release it. So that's gonna risk, there's a lot of capital at risk right there. So, the fact that right now Chinese pictures are doing great should ultimately open things up because there'd be less fear of, of, of a runaway. I think a great example is France, which I've talked about you know, in the past, that the French government set up a system where they're not scared of the studios and the French films always dominate. And there's such great Chinese uh, talent, both in front of the, the camera, behind the camera, that there's room enough for everybody. The two things I'm going to share, and then I'll get into the financing thing uh, for you. But number one is one of my good friends and yours, Bill Kong, who produced uh, Crouching Tiger, which was the first film we ever produced, and did Hero, and a number of films that looked just like those two. The model was worldwide international sales. And sometimes you got an advance out of the US, sometimes you didn't. Um, he always held back Chinese rights for himself, but he was able to finance the picture internationally. You can't do that anymore. And the last two years, especially the last few months, looking at his pictures, they're pure Chinese, nothing international about it, no co-productions, no partners, and he's making more money than he ever did. And so his, I don't know all the Chinese names to his movies, but uh, he had um, Beijing to Beijing Seattle. Seattle. It's called Finding Mr. Right. Yeah. Yes. And then there was the other one that won all the awards in Hong Kong, the police drama thing, starts with C. Yeah, Cold War, okay. Oh, right. Just pictures like that. Um, he was an investor in Journey to the West, so it was great. So from the banker, what I, what I look at is, is two things. One, and Chris already talked about this, is that from a, from a global point of view, so being agnostic as to the language of the film and where it's coming from, I always ask, can it be sold? Can you sell it? And if it can be sold, meaning can the distribution rights be sold you know, the United States, Canada, Germany, Japan, the UK, etc. If you can sell those rights, I can finance it. In China, it's different because most of the pictures are only going to play in China, and there's one window. And so there you need a partner who has a strong balance sheet. So in China, we've built partnerships with companies there who are pretty recognizable. 
who you know, had the balance sheet that if one film messed up, it would be okay. If they had a multiple films, we'd have to rethink about our strategy. But the one film that I'm really interested in seeing how it turns out is one of our clients in China has partnered with a studio here, and so you can probably guess who this is, who has a deal with a great producer in the UK. And so they're making a romantic comedy that has a big name US star, has a big name as the male lead, has a big name um, Chinese actress um, in, in that role. It's a kind of a love triangle where the American guy falls in love with the Chinese girl who has a translator who falls in love with the American guy and it takes place in uh, US and in uh, London and in Beijing. And so this will be predominantly English language, but it's being built from the beginning from, from both sides. And so I, I didn't read the script, so I don't know how it ends. But I'll be really interested to see if this is something that works, because this will really tell us a lot about the future of co-productions. Do you think the fact that the genre that sold so well for so long, the action genre, is no longer selling, is, are now, are we scrambling now to find another genre? I mean, people are, do, is it possible that a Chinese romantic comedy could sell, although one hasn't really done well? Again, only action films have sold so far, really, action or action thrillers or, you know, that genre. What, what is going on in the foreign market? Well, since 2005, international films from anywhere stop selling. And a lot of it has to do with what the studios how, how they evolved. Uh, remember the film Crash? Crash changed the whole style of film. So once Crash, when Bob Yari got to win an Academy Award, the studios were like, heck with this, we're gonna make crashes. And so all of a sudden, all of these indie studio arms cropped up. And, but instead of making $10 million indie movies, they were making $40 million indie movies with $40 million p and spent minimums. And they realized that they weren't making any money. Harvey Weinstein was still winning Academy Awards. <laughs> you know, I think Focus snuck in there one year. And they realized this isn't the way to go. Prior to that, all those arms were buying foreign pictures. I mean, remember there was Life is Beautiful uh, from uh, Roberto Benigni, and I think he won uh, you know, Best Picture in addition to winning you know, Best Foreign Picture. And before that, you had other great Italian pictures. There was Colia from, from Czech Republic. And just all over the world, you'd have pictures that would play here that don't play here anymore because studios no longer allocate a spot to foreign language. So it's not just China. So what I've noticed internationally since 2005 is that most, most international distributors focus on local production, and then they'll buy some US films. And so it's, but it's been hard for everybody to travel. By the way, another thing that he touched upon, which is a, a phenomenon that we're sort of watching too, is that at the same point, it, it's sort of interesting, we had overlapping conditions and, and somebody's gonna lose here, but with, with the massive amount of box office that was generated from the imports in China last year, we saw for the first time, it pretty much started at Cannes of last year and then it spread into Toronto and AFM, but you started seeing these massive MGs paid for um, on, on titles that were sort of, that looked and felt like it, things that could work as imports in China. Um, you know, MGs and, you know, two to five million expendables in the 13, 14 million the range. Wall Street, which will probably what did that sell for? I can't say, but it's, it's, because no, I didn't, it, you bring it up and you're not going to, all right, no, but seriously, they were selling. as much as expendable. Right, I mean, you're seeing these movies sell, and, and now what, what's crazy is the overhang of those purchases are on movies that are getting made now and are going to start coming out, you know, uh, in the next three months to the next year, and they're going to be coming out into a completely different environment in China, an environment that if they're lucky enough to get theatrically released, they might not make a dollar and the other fact is is that they might not get theatrically released and then they're relegated to the the dvd and digital revenues and and that's never going to make their mg back not even close so it's interesting how how that tipping point occurred after everybody spent all their money so it'll be interesting and and the other point which you saw is that pre-sales of China for the first time, starting at Cannes, Toronto, and AFM, were now being banked on 
um, by the sales agents, whether it's Film Nation or Sierra Affinity or whatever, in order to put the money together because you lost Portugal, you lost Spain, you lost Greece, Italy. Um, I mean, Greece halved all their MGs, right? Even on deals that were close. So suddenly China was supposed to make up for all that. It'll be interesting to see what happens at Cannes this year. Not only that, but uh, the buyers from Russia, most of their accounts were in Cyprus. <laughs> so, good. You know, um, um, with what the, the trend that I've noticed we talked about is, is in terms of the pre-sales or the buyouts coming from, 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 from China, is that prior to AFM of, of November, there would always be language saying that we'll pay you $500,000, we'll pay you a million dollars for the film, but only if we get permission to have it released. If we don't get the release, there's no contract. At AFM, since there was such a bidding war, Wolf of Wall Street was one why I mentioned it, um, that those got stricken out. Because now you have five buyers, the money goes up, you're saying, hey, either buy it or don't buy it. And so they had to take out those restrictions about getting it approved. And I bring up Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street because I was having lunch yesterday with someone from the company that made the movie. And they told me that based on their content, and given Django, they said, that thing's never getting released. Don't repeat that, okay. <laughs> so, what, what I heard you say, Bennett, which was interesting, is that the policy of the studios to really just focus on huge blockbuster movies has, in a way, kind of alienated this, the foreign markets, because you, you either, you're getting those or you're not getting much. I mean, the foreign sales have gone down, because there isn't enough product. There's, it's basically, the world is bifurcated now from huge movies, right, and, and very, very small movies. So what, is, does China have a way? I mean, we're, everyone's searching for a way for these two places that have ample resources to come together, right? China's got the huge market, it's got the cash, it's got the hunger, and America still has a lot of the best filmmaking talent, marketing, whatnot. What is the best way to bring these two formidable uh, countries together in this world? If I had the answer, I could retire. <laughs> if I had that answer. The answer you no, I think, when, I, I think that everyone takes it from different angles. I like the angle that Chris and his company are taking it from because one of the things that we do know is that the studios will always make the best, biggest movies, all right? But the whole world can make the best independent movies. I think for China, it's just a matter of what they want to become, how they want to become it. And they need to figure out what their market is first, you know, before anyone else can do something. But what I like with DMG's model is they know that there's a couple films a year that given their relationships here and their relationships in China, that they can make that work and they can bring it through. And so for the studio here, maybe they get a larger share of the box office. And and for, for China, they get more involvement in these pictures. I think, you know, we'll see what happens on May 3rd, but regardless. It's official now. Iron Man's opening May 3rd, right? Barring... No, we, we, we actually got a, we, we had a last minute change. Part of the reason why my hair is a little messed up is that I was up all night. <laughs> we're gonna be, missing, yeah, we're gonna be officially out 12.01 May 1st. So we get a whole holiday day which is nice and, and so really lonely, or so young, wait. So young. So young, so young is gonna have a, a nice release also, so it's, it's a that nice a sort good of compromise. I think it's okay to say, last time we were on a panel together, we weren't able to talk about this officially, but I think it's okay to talk about it. I think what DMG has accomplished actually is, you know, everybody's been going after co-productions for two main reasons. One is that you get to be released in China as a Chinese film during the holiday season and also you get a more favorable box office split. But it sounds like, if I dare go out on a limb a little bit, is with the two movies they've been involved with, Looper and Iron Man 3, they've got the benefits of co-production without necessarily the official co-production status. Who cares if you have the piece of paper if you get all the other rewards? Am I correct? Or is it two cents you yeah. to talk about? <laughs> yeah, to the, to the most part. I mean, Looper was an interesting one because we actually, um, we got a, a local, it's a long story, but it was sort of a local status. So we actually did do well on the rental for that particular movie. Um, with Iron Man 3, 
what what we noticed, and you know, it's I've, I've been in the biz film business for a long time, so there's a lot of moving parts to making a movie, and there's also a lot of people that I respect that are a lot better at making movies than I am that can make better creative decisions. So, as as we saw certain things occur during the shooting of of Iron Man three, and we started to notice that what we wanted in Iron Man 3 from a China perspective was starting to possibly get in the way of making the best movie possible. You know, remember I talked about the guy in Peoria, Illinois and the woman in Frankfurt. Um, we started to back off and we said, look, Marvel, you're the best in the business at doing this. Uh, they quite frankly are. I mean, Jim Cameron, Marvel, maybe George Lucas, uh, Spielberg. Um, so we're not going to tell you what you have to do. Let's all make the best movie possible. We'll see what we got, and then we're going to figure out what our game plan is. And ultimately, we decided that our game plan was much smarter. Was much smarter in regards to promoting. Remember, I talked about selling to the government. Um, we decided to promote the collaboration between the U.S. and the China and, and China and and a Chinese studio, which is DMG, and two U.S. studios, Marvel and Disney and showcase that and say, hey, this is a collaboration between the two most powerful com countries in the world, um, two great film industries, and you know, we want to push that sort of agenda and, and, and sort of um, labeling of this in order to hopefully get the government to help us um, you know, support the movie a little better than a typical import. And, and at this point, it, it has worked, and knock on wood, um, it does well in China. You know, can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay. I'll tell you what I would like to see. What I would like to see is somebody try to do what, what, what Ang Lee did a while back in his career. So he made a couple movies. Uh, there was uh, The Wedding Banquet, I think it was, was it Eat, Drink, Man? Mm -hmm. And then he did, uh, well, forget about Ride with the Devil, but he did uh, The Ice Storm. You know, he started, you know, going, going both sides. There are some amazing, talented young directors in China that I would like to see somebody here bring them over. This gentleman here, he's already, here. He's already here. There's others too. But I'll let him talk and I'm like embarrass him. And make some movies here. Go back and make movies there. Come here. Can we, we talk about that for a bit? I, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's not just talk about it. This would be my dream too. Because really, that's the only way. I mean, you can't, uh, Ang Lee had the benefit, of course, of being educated here and whatnot. I do feel think that there will be wonderful Chinese filmmakers that will emerge, and not just from the Beijing Film Academy, but from wherever. And yes, they should. I, I encourage my friends in China to spend time abroad to really get a perspective. I think one of the things that keeps Chinese films from being very saleable outside of the world is that if you're in China your entire life, it's hard to get a perspective on China. You know, you're kind of mired in the Chinese view of China. And there is a tendency, in my opinion, to kind of want to put the best foot forward and like, what are they going to think of this? Sometimes you just have to step back. And the artist, for instance, Tai Guotiang, he's lived abroad for a long time. He makes brilliant work that is very Chinese on the one hand, but somehow is able to appeal to a global audience. And I think this is what needs to happen. I, I wish we would see more Chinese filmmakers coming out. Maybe they'll be coming right here to USC. They probably are right here. There's a Peter Stark program has graduated a number. Well, let's let Daniel, a very talented American-born Chinese American filmmaker, um, speak a little bit about that, and then we have just a few minutes for questions. So the time. Uh, sure. So to time. Bennett's point, I mean the the whole idea of um, a writer, or a director, or a producer working in both places. That's absolutely something that I'm I'm, I'm uh, uh, working on with my career right now. I'm uh, working on uh, a screenplay right now that's probably a studio picture here in the U.S., but at the same time developing a couple projects in China. But the thing is, I've, I've maintained relationships with filmmaker friends here and in China as well. And um, uh, it's so interesting because um, my background here in uh, the US was mainly in uh, television and television writing and producing. And so I was very well versed in sort of like the Hollywood system way, system of working, 12 hour days, turnaround uh, call sheets, you know, uh, production reports, insurance policies, and so on and so forth. And then a very uh, filmmaker friend of mine in China, um, she was working on something, and uh, the question came up: Oh, can we, you know, Daniel, do you know a way to shoot this uh, this bit of this movie in uh, in Hawaii? 
right? And I said, oh, well, you know, do you need help with that? And they were saying, oh, well, yeah, 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 we need help. You know, can you help be like the, the US producer for, you know, help us produce this, this aspect of this? I don't know if you ever heard about this part, but. Uh, and so I started, I started, you know, I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. We're gonna bring this director over. And it's gonna be awesome because, you know, she's gonna be shooting a part of a movie in the United States, technically. And, um, uh, and I started approaching all these, uh, you know, vendors and permit offices and so on and so forth. And then the question came back, oh, well, uh, do you have like the insurance policy? And so I went back, oh, what's your liability insurance? Uh, who's your liability insurance person? And the answer came back, Chinese movies don't have insurance policies. <laughs> and uh, if you've worked in film production, you know that here in the US, the very first requirement is a $1 million umbrella liability insurance coverage for any union, any location, any equipment rental, something like that. And then, um, and it's just such a, it's, that's just, I, I tell the story to illustrate that the system of working in China and the US is just completely different. I mean, the expectations are, are completely different going in. I mean, I went into this, you know, started, this lasted five days, me working on this. And, uh, and uh, when I came out of it with, with was, there are still so many places where we don't understand, you know, uh, the the system Americans don't understand the system working in China and Chinese people don't under, uh, Chinese don't understand the system of working in the U.S. and um, uh, I think that to make Bennett's vision come true will require, like Janet said, people spending a lot of time in both places working on other projects in different capacities in order to learn all the uh, the differences and all the minutiae.